Thank All you. right, everyone, put your hands together for Jen. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, this is the first time we've had an engineering focused event here. First time we've got a meetup here. And it's great to see so many people here. Uh, I want a quick thank you to Ellison and Connie and Tall, et cetera, for helping us set this up because uh, we got a bunch of good stuff. Um, and I need to quickly describe uh, what Globality does. Otherwise, uh, Ron, who's our CTO, will probably kill me tomorrow. Um, <laughs> So Globality is in the business of making globalization work for everybody. And by everyone, we mean specifically not really large, big corporations. Uh, so it's a really interesting company to be at uh, because there is a very purpose-driven mission to what we're doing. Uh, and if you think about global trade, which most people don't, uh, it is something where it's dominated by large companies. It's not made by large companies, not because they're the best at what they do, but because they're well known or they have some sort of market advantage because they're large. Uh, and so what Globality is trying to do is to make that market work for small and medium sized companies, specifically because they are better at what they do, have the best people, the best outcomes, and usually a lower price. Um, so really fun place to be. If you're interested in working here, come talk to me, come talk to Ron afterwards. Um, I'm gonna talk mostly about our engineering core technologies uh, and a little bit about myself as well. So um, I've been writing services professionally for about 15 years. I'm currently the chief architect at Globality, which means I actually write a hell of a lot of code. Um, it's not a abstract 10,000 foot architecture job. It is a get down and dirty and figure out what was actually not working and make it work. I, I tell everyone who I interview that my job is to make all the stuff work. And that's both people and technology. Um, about 10 years ago, one of my coworkers started writing Python for little, little you know, automation scripts. And somehow I fell in love and found that it is just a much better language for me personally. Uh, before, when I first started my career, I was writing C++, moved into Java, Things are better now. Um, philosophy is that software architecture is all about people, and I mean both end users and especially employees and coworkers. So most decisions that we make, all decisions we make, are about what is best for either us personally or our users who we are trying to serve. Um, I think that that is actually somewhat novel, um, and I'm going to get into details. I hope. Um, I think that when you have the right culture, the right values, the right architecture, and a great team, you can do just about anything, and I'm excited about it in that regard. Uh, okay, so some numbers. I'm going to give some numbers because this is talking about microservices, and microservices are not something you do because it's faddish, it's something you do because it helps solve a particular problem. So Globality has been a lot around for less than two years, or about two years. I've been here since about last February. Some of the early code doesn't exist anymore. So you can have some idea how much time actually went into writing code. In that time, we've easily written 500,000 lines of code. Um, this is surprisingly hard to calculate, but it's a lot. Uh, we have at least 90 Git repositories we work with, which is also a lot. And we only have, okay, we have about 25 Python services that run in production and only about 20 developers. So the reason for microservices is, first of all, every service is small. So you can theoretically figure out what it does in a small amount of time. I would say even more importantly, people are really bad about sticking to interfaces unless you make them. Uh, so I've had coworkers in the past who were like, were really excited about large mono repos. And they said, oh, yeah, we just draw lines here. People can't cross those lines. And people always cross those lines. There is nothing better than saying code is in separate repos and code talks across a network to make sure people stick to interfaces. Um, but really, the reason for microservices is organizational philosophy. With 20 people and the volume of code that we have at Globality, the only way to solve the problems that matter to the business, not the problem, is to put people on problems not put people on technology. 
you can't have a team of people who know how to, let's say, write reports and then not have a month go by where reports are important. Like it doesn't, the math doesn't work. You have to put people on the problem that matters, which means that the technology that people work on has to be flexible. You have to be able to move around and to work on something they've never seen before, which is why having a small surface area is important. So uh, this is a talk about microservices. It's a talk about how we approach that. And I want to start with a actual real example problem <coughs> of how running software across at scale becomes hard sort of suddenly. Um, most people have done Python logging. Raise your hand if you've written Python logging. Adam, come on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, coming from Java or C++, this is a huge improvement. Uh, you can't just import batteries included logging is there. Um, so that's nice. But this doesn't actually work. We need to configure your logging. OK, now we'll actually output something. That's nice. Still not really there yet. Because you probably need some sort of log format that tells you something about what you logged. <coughs> um, even this isn't really good enough because that name value there, what's it going to say? It's going to say root by default. So if you want to have something better than that, you end up writing something like this. This is not the code we actually run, but this is the code that I wrote as an example where you inspect your current function, your current class, or all of the above, and inject that into your logging context. And this is just one more step in making a very small concern of your application work properly. And then there's a lot more. You need to figure out what logging levels to use. In my opinion, there's only four levels of logging that make sense. There's debug, which is what you do personally and your locally. There's info, which just shows up all the time, preferably once per meaningful context. There's warning, which something someone's going to look at the next day because it goes in their email box. And there's error, which means people are going to wake up and be, be alerted. This way, anything else is meaningless because you can't act to it differently. So you have to make all your code work that way. You have to add more metadata. Something logs, you need to know where it came from. What service is this? What machine is it on? Uh, what network is it in? You end up wanting log aggregation because your machines become, are, are cattle, not pets, and you have to have lots of machines all over the place. And so you go into some, some, logly, some system like Logly, which is what we use, and you have one that is JSON, so it's parsable. Uh, and then you also want to make sure your customer data doesn't show up there because that's part of your, your SLA or your whatever. And the next thing you know, you have something sort of like this, which is an actual logging configuration using Python dict config. And even this isn't really complete. So why am I saying all this about logging when I talk about microservices? I'm saying that because in order to make an actual service work in real life, there are tens of things like logging. And each of them has the same level of complexity. So you have to figure out how to talk to a database, how to gather your stats and metrics, where you're going to store config and secrets, how you're going to monitor things. And you start having common patterns, things like basic CRUD operations, basic persistence, all of the above. Um, and now multiply that by every microservice you have. I said at the beginning, we have 25 microservices in production right now. So you potentially have 25 different copies of basically that same bit of logging config multiplied by 10 different things you care about, logging databases, metrics, blah, 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 blah. And it blows up. And it blows up in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, the first thing is that you're constantly changing what you think is the best practice. So you have one service that has the log configuration you wrote two years ago, another one, the one you wrote yesterday, and they're not consistent. On top of that, you have people who are running a new service, and they don't know where to look for for the best practice, so they go copy something. And it's not quite what it should have been, but it's close, and so it's kind of good enough, but it's not good enough, and it ends up breaking something. And the more, even, even bigger, and probably the deepest problem is the human problem. As I said at the beginning, this is about people, and architecture is about people. You want your team to be productive, and they don't know what they're supposed to do because you have so many examples of doing things differently. So that is the problem that I, as an architect, care about solving. And the solution is convention. And the solution is basically figure out how to do something well, write some code that knows how to do that, 
put that somewhere that you can share, make as much as possible work by default, and wire it into everything. You have some versioning, some testing to do, but you can basically have the right answer for logging, the right answer for databases, whatever exists in some library. All of your, piece, your code gets that. The next time you release that solution, everything gets it and it keeps working, as long as the boundaries between things are well-defined. So how do we achieve this panacea? Um, there are multiple ways. You don't have to follow the one that we chose. Um, the first thing that comes to mind if you are coming from a Java background like I am is dependency injection. This is a well-known solution for this kind of problem. And it's a solution that no one in the Python world thinks is the right solution. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I've read some, some posts about uh, it being the wrong choice because Python imports and modules work well. Uh, I've read it being the right choice because Python is explicit and simple and dependency injection is not. I don't really buy any of that. But I also don't think the dependency injection libraries that are out there are any good. Um, the pinject library is the best one I've found. I think it's really well written, but I think it solves some of the wrong problems. Uh, a lot of these problems, so a lot of these solutions try to solve problems from the point of view of someone who's coming from the Java world, which is to say everything is a class. You're only going to inject classes into your application, which is wrong. Uh, and you really need to care about how you handle like really complicated things. Like, oh, I might have this in this case, and this in this case, and this in this case. But the reality in a microservice is it's a small surface area. And so you just don't have that problem. You can be a lot simpler. Um, and I'll say, plug the last thing especially, one of the most important things you have to do is take your configuration and turn that into code. And most DI solutions I've seen, even the ones in the Java space, do that rather poorly. They don't really have an opinion about what configuration looks like. They let you hang yourself in that. There are lots of frameworks out there. If you have a framework you love, go for it. I don't. Uh, I've tried some. I found that they tend to push me in directions I don't like, and I want something that's minimal. Um, so Microcosm, this is our solution. It's open source. It's on our GitHub page. You go to code to go about You can see a bunch of things about how it works. Uh, basic idea is mostly stolen from the pinject library, but written in a different way. We have a graph of objects. Basically, a, bunch, a registry of names to objects, things we want to use in our application. We have a configuration loading mechanism for pulling configuration from various sources. We use that to create objects using a registry of factories. We have a couple of other nice little hooks in there around passing data between these things for logging and other kinds of diagnostics. And the, on the whole, that's all that it does. The whole thing is a couple of Python files because what we actually do is we put all the other things in our system into other libraries. We have a library for working with Flask, which is our choice for the web. We have a library for working with Postgres. We have a library for working for, with SNS and SQS with PubSub. We have a library for a bunch of different things. Uh, and so we found that this is a really nice way to have a decoupled, loosely tied system that solves that problem of how your microservices do a bunch of things without it becoming out of hand. So some examples, because code is important. Uh, this is the basic interface for microcosm. Uh, you've got the idea of a binding, which is just a name, just a string. Microservices are really small. You can pick a unique string. You won't run into conflicts. If you do, you can change a string. It's not a problem that you have to solve. You have some defaults, because you want defaults. You want the system to be, require a minimal amount of configuration. You have a function that takes the object graph, which is the thing that contains all the things you care about. And it produces something else that can attach to the object graph. And that something else can use the config. That's the basic pattern that we use, and it's been really successful. The usage is make me an object graph, and then I want to access something. And the graph is, says, do I have this thing? No, nope, I don't. OK. Do I have something registered that knows how to make this thing? Oh, I do. OK, go make it. The end. Logging, that's all. Because <laughs> behind the scenes, there's some function that knows how to build that giant dict thing I showed you guys before. Uh, we solve the naming problem this way. There's a little decorator built in. It's not required to use it, but ends up nice. Database access, this builds you a SQL alchemy engine that talks to Postgres. There's a bunch of things we think are useful, like health, like, um, I forget, but it's useful. <laughs> uh, 
little more complicated when we get into the world of web, web requests. Um, this ends up being complicated because you have to define more things, but there isn't actually a lot here. So we chose Marshmallow as a way to define our encodings over JSON over the wire. So in this case, I've defined a person which has a single name field. So you can imagine that as a JSON dictionary, key name, value, whatever name you choose. A function that takes some inputs and returns some data. In this case, it's returning a list of things that have a name and the total number of things. That's an internal convention we've chosen. We're working on supporting not just counts there, but also sort of token-based pagination. That's a whole other story. And then at the bottom, we say, make me an object graph. Use Swagger convention. I'll get back to that in a second. Configure this graph with a endpoint of type search with this person schema and run. Um, a lot of this ends up getting hidden in your overall application creation so that when you're defining a route, you're really only defining the schema definition, the function, and the mapping. Um, why do we do this instead of just writing a simple Flask route? I'm going to switch to a demo. How do I do this? Uh, let me exit out of the presentation. I apologize. Um, there we go. All right. So this is so you can see that basically the same code I just showed you guys. I'm going to run class server. I'm going to now make a request and figure out my announcement. No. Not working. It's, it's full screen. Okay. Uh, so I go to This is sort of the punchline. Uh, Swagger, people know what Swagger is? Hands, if you don't know what it is. Awesome, people don't know what it is. Swagger is a way of defining an API, usually over HTTP, usually in a sort of restless way. Uh, the reason why you do this is because then you can generate code that talks to that API. So what I have here is auto-generated from our code. So. I use some convention that's built into microcosm. I wire it in because it's a well-known name that's in a factory that just populates. And the way that I create my routes is such that everything is classified and it knows what I'm doing. I didn't have to write a Spiker document to define what APIs I have and separately write my code and risk them being out of sync. I wrote my code once and Spiker just happened. And what's nice about that is now we can have code that knows how to talk to our API that's generated by asking the system, what do you support? Uh, so back to the top title of this, top, of this talk. This is about convention-driven microservices. So microservices have a bunch of problems. I'm arguing that they are solved to some degree by having a really good configuration system. And if you have a really good configuration system, you can inject conventions that make your life really easy so you don't have to do the same thing over and over again or write a lot of code. Uh, and that is hopefully the end of the talk. Thank you. Any questions? Can you give me some examples of your microservices? Sure. So uh, our business is about global trade. Uh, we work with companies. Uh, so we have a service that knows about the companies. Uh, as part of making this global trade work, we're trying to match certain kinds of companies, companies that want to do work 
the companies that can provide that work. So we have a service that knows how to calculate matches. In the course of doing that work, those two companies might chat. The service knows about about chat. Uh, they might sign a contract, which was about contracts. They might want to build out a proposal. We have that. We want to do payments. We have that. Um, what am I missing, guys? Files. Files. We want to upload chat. files. What? Video chat. Video chat. We want to do that. Uh, we might yeah, want to know. do search. Uh, what was that? <laughs> Access control is a big one. Access control is a ton of fun. If you ever come interview here, I will ask you at Access Control because it's a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that good enough? Yeah. All right. Anything else? Yeah. In microcosm, what's the difference between graph.use and graph.logger? Is logger special in some way? Uh, so I am abusing, we are abusing the get adder access. Yeah. So when you say graph.logger, you implicitly go check a cache, see whether the logger's there. If it's not there, you go check a registry to see whether the factory for that. If you don't, if you have that, then it makes one. Graph.use is just a way of saying ref lazily evaluate these references all at once. So we use that at startup time in our applications to make sure everything loads as early as possible because you really don't want things to fail to load later on. There's also a little mode where you can lock the graph such that any subsequent reference will fail aggressively in case you didn't configure it properly. And then you can run unit tests to make sure that you, your configurations all load and then you're very unlikely to start up improperly. Yeah. It's a really cool library, um, and if uh, you're ever kind of looking for inspiration, I would say, about kind of similar things, it reminds me a lot of uh, some closure libraries, like the components and uh, mounts and kind of things they use for configuration management. So like closure is like a hard, like functional, like programming yeah. language, right? And they hate state, but you need like inherently state for like, things like you know, big disconnections or whatever. And then so like kind of the thinking was they need to bring in some of like kind of objects uh, like kind of paradigm to manage these types of things. And then so there's the libraries that kind of come about. So uh, uh, yeah, if you're a fan of just like kind of interesting like around similar things maybe, but I don't know, mind a lot. Well interesting. I have followed closure to the degree that I've seen Rich Hickey speak a few times and been, been really impressed, but I've never written it. I definitely don't know those libraries, but it's a great good idea. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you.